Hello everyone and welcome back to day 46 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So uh, today we continue our kind of uh, introduction track to, uh, to domain specific languages in Python. Um, before we jump in, I was just uh, going through the forms yesterday and responding to things and just wanted to clear some things up. Um, one reason that I'm still um, calling these videos the, you know, I'm, I'm using the same title um, for, for yesterday and today as I have for uh, the videos last, last week is that um, I don't want uh, anyone to consider these the sort of the formal hardware introduction videos because uh, the way I'm treating them, they are these are just kind of warm up videos that are, um, you know, that have a topic that certainly will lead into what we do next with hardware, but um, I'm intending it to be warm up, uh, getting back into the swing of things for me personally, doing Python stuff. Um, and also as a side effect, I guess, kind of exposing uh, some of that stuff to um, maybe to people who haven't done Python programming or haven't done this kind of Python programming before. So if something doesn't make sense, like people were asking questions about some of the hardware design language stuff, um, you know, please, please wait until next week when we will sort of do the more uh, ordered introduction to that side of things. Um, for now, just um, if, if something about the you know the logic design side or the HDL side doesn't quite make sense, uh, please uh, please be a little bit patient. I'll try to cover that sort of in an ordered way next week. Um, this week, though, I just want to continue experimenting um, to lay some of the groundwork uh, for my basically for my own benefit, but hopefully in a way that's uh, helpful to to people as well. If um, if you're new to Python, but if if this is all old hat for you, then feel free to um, um, feel feel free to, uh, to 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 sort of not pay too much attention or even skip these entirely, and tune back in. I guess probably next week when we will have the sort of the intro to hardware series uh, starting properly. So uh, these are kind of bridge uh, videos where I'm just I'm doing stuff that's going to be related to the to the to the hardware stuff. But um, if this seems more disordered than usual, even more disordered than usual, uh, this, that's kind of intentional because I'm not. Um, this is this is just sort of me playing around with various ideas, uh, getting back getting back into the swing of things because it's been like a year since I did this kind of stuff, so I need to get back into the right mindset. And if I just dove directly into it, it would be counterproductive, I think. So um, anyway, that's just a little bit of context for that. Um, let me uh, let me show you um, what I did off stream, which is sort of building on what we did on stream last time, and then I'll talk about a few things I want us to do today. Uh, and we'll see what we get. So um, last time we started with a clean slate. Um, uh, again, the what we did in the first two or three videos was was sort of intended to be self-contained, but not necessarily a direct foundation for what was to follow. What I'm doing now, I'm planning to you know develop into um, into what we'll be eventually using for hardware design. Um, so, uh, one, one, you know, and, and that had a bunch of implications. One of them is that it's kind of module oriented. So there's a notion, there's a first class notion of modules, which are kind of like a reusable circuit schematic you can instantiate in different contexts with different kinds of connectivity. Uh, it also importantly has uh, an actual type system. Not everything is a single bit. So there are both, uh, currently the two types are basically individual bits and bit vectors. Um, and, uh, and we have type checking done when you, you know, if you take the bitwise and of two things, they have to have the same bit width, for example. Um, we don't have all the operators implemented, but uh, we have some of the basics sort of stubbed in. Um, and uh, yeah, just to show you some of the module stuff, if you weren't here yesterday. Um, so here's an example. Um, you probably remember this thing from last time. Um, this is just a full adder, a symmetric full adder. Um, and uh, uh, so, so this takes you know three input bits and output two output bits, not as a bit vector. Although we could have output it as a bit vector, but just as a Python tuple. And um, so, you know, the first one corresponds to the sum, and the second one corresponds to the carry. Um, and so here is a um, here's a module, and it's um, you, you can see here are the inputs. We have um, two bit vectors, each with uh, eight, uh, an input carry, which is a single bit input. 
Uh, and then on the output side, we have the outputs. And the, these have inferred type here. You can, I'll show in a bit how you can specify the type explicitly, but um, it's sometimes convenient to just have an inferred type for the result uh, for the output values. So you don't have to duplicate them or whatever. Uh, so that's what I'm demoing here. Um, so one of these, the output, has the same width as the input. So this is also a bit vector of width 8. Sorry. My fan was blowing in my microphone. Um, and then the C out is the um, the output carry. So that's another one bit output that corresponds to, uh, you know, sort of the output version of this. Um, and then here we have the thing that actually uh, constructs the circuit to, to hook things up to compute these outputs. And um, if you look at what we had, I can't remember. We had something like this last time, and it will look pretty similar, if not identical, to what we had. And um, the main difference is we now have proper bit vectors. And so when we're doing stuff like this, in one represents a bit vector. And so when we do this subscript i, um, we're not indexing a Python vector directly, where you know we have a we're basically this this thing here, this subscript this expression corresponds to a bit indexing operation, a bit vector indexing operation. So this has a separate AST node. Um, but this thing here has type bit. Uh, so you go from a bit vector to type bit. And so both of these are bits. C, of course, is a bit. Well, C, actually, the fact that C is a bit is maybe a little bit subtle because it starts out as a Python constant, but when that gets converted implicitly into a node, that becomes a single bit number corresponding, you know, with a value of zero, uh, a constant. But anyway, um, and then we chain it through like we did in the original case. Um, the thing, uh, this S vector here that we fill in is actually a Python list um, because when you're constructing things piecemeal like this, it's convenient to construct them as a Python data type and then convert them to a bit vector at the end um, because then you can do all the usual Python things to it that you'd want to do. Um, like you can, for example, you can do mutation, right? Um, which you can't do to a bit vector. A bit vector is an immutable type, um, right? It uh, just represents a concatenation of bits, but uh, Python lists we can, you know, assign to in place and then we can convert it to a bit vector once we've fully constructed this thing. So that's the idea. Uh, and so here, what goes on is as is S is a vector of constants, Python constants, when we um, when it gets converted to an output here, I mean, I can even show you what it does. Um, this is a little bit polymorphic. You can either specify or type or a node. So if it's a if if the uh, operand of this output function is a type, then essentially um, this corresponds to an output with that specified type and currently no connected operand. Um, nothing driving that output, in other words. Um, but if otherwise, we try to convert it to a node and we use that thing's type as the output type. Um, and so this as node thing. Um, It, it, you know, there's a few different cases. This thing here basically corresponds to what we had in the original two videos, uh, except that it computes the narrowest type that fits the constant. Um, and if you want to be explicit about the bit width, you can cast it to a specific bit vector type. Um, but that's sort of the default width um, for a Python constant that gets converted into a constant node. Uh, and then here is uh, an iterable. So if you have an iterable, an abstract, so ABC stands for abstract base class, um, Python has this thing to support its duct typing where um, and there's a bunch of these that are built in like uh, so-called abstract base classes which are not really base classes but they behave as base classes in the sense that you can use is instance on them and so even though um, the iterer being an iterable thing in Python is a protocol it's not based on subclassing you don't have to like in, it's not like in Java where you would have to you know implement like a sub, you know you have to subclass an interface or something like that uh, or implement an interface explicitly. It's based on just certain functions being defined in the standard duct typing vein. Um, but still, there is an abstract base class that you can just ask, is this thing an instance of that? And it basically does all the protocol conformity checks for you. So in this case, what we do here is if something is an iterable, then we convert it to a, a bit vector, by which results from concatenating the bits of that iterable. So um, for example, if you do something like this, um, so this is a Python list, which is iterable. It could also be a tuple. Uh, if you use this in a context as a node, it gets treated as a concatenation 
of the contents implicitly. Um, and so you can see what it does here. Um, if you call bits, it, it creates a concatenation of, of all the contents. Uh, and this involves a new node called concat node. Let me just show you what that does. Concat node is a multi-way uh, a multi-way node, so it can take any number of input nodes and uh, concatenates them as a bit vector. Um, well, you, so, so the operands can either be bit vectors, in which case, you know, they add however wide they are to the final result. If they're a single bit, they add, you know, one. So they kind of, in this context, are treated as a bit vector of width one, and that's it. So, for example. Um, in the case where you have a, you know, in, in the case we just co covered where you have a, a Python list of ones and zeros, each of those gets converted to a bit vector of, of length one, and those all get concatenated in that order. Uh, and the concatenation order implicitly, by the way, is least significant bit to most significant bit. So the first element of the list will be the least significant element in the concatenation and so on. Um, so that's how you build, you know, bigger vectors from smaller vectors. And ultimately, if you want to build, if you have, you know, in, in our case, if you have, if you specify what you want for every bit of a bit vector, you can concatenate all of those to get a bit vector that has that as the individual bits. Um, and that, so that's kind of how you construct bigger vectors from smaller vectors. Um, to go along with that, and this is, we actually did implement this yesterday, we have index node and slice node, which are just ways of taking a bit vector and slicing it or indexing it. So you can index a, you can index a bit vector by a static index. When I say a static index, what I mean is it has to be known at uh, construction time. So it's not like the thing that's indexing can itself be a bit vector that's interpreted as a number or anything like that. Um, so it has to be a Python constant uh, in order to be used as an index. And, um, and similarly, slices for you know slicing. So you're not just extracting one bit, you're extracting some bit slice. Um, and so we covered all of this yesterday, but I'm just kind of rehearsing it. But uh, I think that's the main thing that's new. Um, one thing I added that wasn't there yesterday is that, um, um, and I mentioned we would be doing this. I just didn't do it yesterday. Uh, you can connect. You can connect certain kinds of nodes after construction. So um, let, let me show this. I have a bunch of equivalent. Uh, first, let me just quickly rehearse what this does. So this is the the adder. Yesterday we had the interface, but not the implementation. So here we have the implementation that actually has the full adder. Um, here we have our 16-bit uh, adder, which uh, just concatenates two 8-bit adders and chains together the, the the carries to to get the right result. So um, this is a little bit different from yesterday. The way things work now is when you call the when you when you call the module, you know, as a function to construct an instance of a module. You uh, you only specify the inputs. Uh, I think I specified the outputs yesterday. That was kind of a mistake. Um, that is roughly how something like this would work in Verilog or VHDL, but it has some implications in terms of what can go on kind of the left-hand side and right-hand side of those sort of connections. Um, and uh, for now, at least, the semantics are going to be much simpler if that only works for inputs. And so um, for now, you only specify the inputs. Um, so you specify, you can see here, I'm just repeating stuff we covered yesterday, but I just want to remind everyone we we um, you hook the lower eight bits into uh, into the first adder and the and the initial uh, the and the the low carry in comes from whatever was passed in here, uh, and then for the high adder we pass in the high bits, uh, and then we pass in the output from the low adder, uh, or sorry the, the the C out from the low adder becomes the C N of the high adder. And then for the ultimate output, um, you um, you specify the output bits. Here I'm just using what we just covered about how if you specify a list, it gets implicitly concatenated. And so here we're concatenating um, the, the low adder's output and the high adder's output. So this produces the low output bits and the high output bits. And uh, the final C out is the you know the high adder C out. So that's the idea. So that's one way to write it. Um, another way to write it is like this. Um, I mean, right now there's some definitely some redundant syntax you can use if you want. Um, oh, right, we have to. Um, if I want to do that, I have to. I have to do something like this. 
uh, so you, you can this is another way you can do it which is you first specify you first specify sort of the interface specifying all the types um, and if you do this then essentially um, nothing is connected and um, uh, in general that's not allowed right now I'm not checking for it but the idea is that when you're defining a module like this uh, you have to connect the outputs right because otherwise you're not driving the outputs so um, that's kind of a, a sanity check we're going to add but um, anyway so that's the idea but you can specify them separately like this and then you can connect after the fact like after specifying the interface you can connect some some you can connect some node to driving that output and in this case uh, here's what we're doing um, and that should work let me just try to rerun it so that works uh, you you should also be able to do this. Um, oh right, probably. Um, I'm not doing the type coercion correctly. Okay, that works. Um, so. Um, so you can do this sort of thing, and it's basically the same as this, except that you're now kind of specifying those things separately. Um, you can also use, there's an infix version of the concatenation, which is sometimes useful. Um, I mean, it's available. Um, this is using the new, uh, this symbol here as an infix operator is new, I think, in Python 3.4 or 3.5. Uh, it was intended for use as a matrix multiplication operator. Um, which does mean that it has roughly it has like multiplication like uh precedence and associativity and so uh, it's kind of a, a decent candidate for concatenation um but anyway you can also in general you can use this uh which is i i think is it, this looks more like how like in verilog for example uh you use this notation to do bit concatenation and you can actually do that here too if you can believe it you can actually do this too Oops. Just sort of as a side effect of the fact that this is iterable, and you know, like I mentioned yesterday, Python 3.6 guarantees uh, that the kind of the iteration order for uh, for di for things that are hash table based, like dic or dictionaries and sets and stuff, uh, now preserve insertion order. So even this actually works. Any iterable that concatenates to the right thing will will do the trick. Um, so anyway, so that's so so those are those are two options. Um, here's yet another one, um, it's actually, let's, let's leave this here for the output and then, uh, let me put this down to the bottom. And, uh, so here's another thing you can do in terms of connecting things piecemeal. Um, you can you can instantiate so just as you can so here's the way to think about it the outputs of the module you're defining are kind of like pins that you want you have to connect something to in order to complete the definition of your module um, similarly if you instantiate another module instance the input the input nodes of that module instance from your point of view are things you have to drive from the inside of that module it's the opposite right because what is to me an input is to you an output and so on so um, in the same way that we can kind of define the outputs but not connect them and then connect them you know, later, uh, we can do the same with inputs of module instances. So you can, you can, create, um, you can create these, uh, you know, the low and high adder initially with nothing connected. Um, and then you can connect them up like this, um, which uses this assignment syntax. And, um, I'll show you how this is implemented. It's very simple. It basically, it, it does, uh, actually, let me first prove to you that it works. And maybe it doesn't. OK, it still works. Um, this actually does the same thing as this. It's just syntactic sugar. Um, and just to prove it, if I do this, I should probably, OK, so it's not a good proof. I guess I don't have any real checks right now. Um, but anyway, these two things are the same. 
Um, and the way that works is quite simple. Um, it's this, first off, it's the same basic idea of connecting stuff as here. So it's just the idea that certain things are connectable and you can call connect on them. But in this case, because they are pins essentially, or they're ports of a module instance, um, and this is probably not, I should probably use Python property descriptors, but for now I did this simple hack where if you're doing a set attribute on something that is currently set to a module input node, um, then it calls connect on that thing. So what that means is, you know, if you have something like this um, and you call connect, um, then um, the name is going to be some input. So it sees if that thing, you call and get adder, it sees if that thing already has a um, an association there. And if it, if, if it does, and if that thing is a module input node, which it is, if it's an input, if some input designates an input, then rather than reassigning that binding of the attribute, it calls connect. Um, and, and this was just a, a quick hack to do this, but um, there's more legitimate ways to do it, like or cleaner ways, I guess, in Python. Um, but uh, this was a quick, dirty way to do that. So, but it just corresponds to calling this uh, input function. Um, so that's kind of nice. Uh, incidentally, the you can't do the you can't do the equivalent. Um, this is a temptation if if you're not too familiar with Python semantics. You can't do something like this. So right now, we have um, you know suppose you take uh, suppose you take something like this. You might think you can just do this, like sort of in simulation of this kind of thing, that you can just do, I don't know, you could do something like this, uh, or whatever, right? Or um, like you can just assign it directly. The problem is if you do that, that just that that just reassigns the binding of the name out to that new thing. So now this thing doesn't exist anymore. So that's not really what you want. The reason we can get away with it in this case is that, um, when there's a field access, you know, like an attribute access on the left-hand side with an, with an assignment, that is a special form that has special semantics. Um, but anyway, just a heads up, you can't do that for um, for things like the outputs that are just like naked things. Like um, they're not attributes of another thing at the point where we're doing this assignment. So anyway, just a, a small note on that. Um, all right, so that was some, some stuff I did off stream. Um, let me make sure I didn't break this. All right. Um, all right, all right, all right. The, um, okay, so some things I wanted to do today. Um, I, I don't want to do simulation stuff right now because uh, I want to get things, you know, I want to get things to a little more uh, complete point before we do that. Um, so, uh, but one thing I thought would be uh, would be good to do both for debugging because you can already see, as an example, I, I do have pretty printing here, um, but it's very hard to see repetitive structure because it doesn't really distinguish, you know, the reason this thing here looks so huge. This is uh, this is basically the the expression corresponding to the 8-bit adder, but this looks way more explosively large than it really is because there's a ton of shared sub-expressions and stuff like that. Uh, and it's hard to show that uh, with a linear text representation. You really want a graph representation, ideally something graphical. So uh, since we'll be needing this anyway, I thought uh, a fun thing to do, uh, and this may also, if, if people haven't used GraphWiz before, for uh, it's kind of a debugging tool, a visualization tool for debugging, um, this might be fun to see as well, and it's definitely going to be useful for us. So I thought the first thing we would do today in terms of uh, new coding is we would do a GraphWiz generator, a dot file generator for Graph GraphWiz that generates you know, a dot file that describes a graph, and then we use GraphWiz to lay it out and generate an SVG file that we can look at in our browser. Um, and you know, maybe later on we can use a, a, a better visualization tool than just your browser if we want to be able to navigate into Submodules and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, so here's what I uh, here's what I mean. Um, so um, it's just something I wrote out this morning to remind myself of how to do this shit. Um, so this is the kind of thing I plan on doing, where um, we're going to generate one of these record uh, nodes in GraphWiz for every 
uh, for every node in our graph. So this represents, of course, a, uh, a summation node, has two input ports, X and Y. It has one output port, C. Um, and then there are nodes that you connect, and they have arrows to connect them and so on. And of course, we don't lay this out ourselves. The way this is actually generated is uh, you write this dot file. Um, so we have a directed graph. That's what digraph means. Uh, you specify the ranking direction, which is left to right, and then you specify a bunch of nodes. Um, um, the, the main thing we're going to be using here to, to do things is this uh, thing called a record node, where the label is not just a flat text string. Um, actually, this is true for most of these nodes, is that there's this kind of internal language you can use for labels. Um, in the case of records, you can specify this kind of hbox, vbox type thing where um, you can see uh, to specify this first column that has the X and Y input ports. Um, there's an outer uh, curly brace to surround the whole thing, the whole record. And then for the first column, uh, there's this part and each field is uh, separated by a uh, pipe, a vertical pipe. Um, and then the way it works is um, you can create these, um, first off, the, the, the human readable labels are just the X's and Y's uh, and the plus and the C. Um, and um, the thing that's in, uh, in angle braces uh, is basically the, uh, I can't remember what GraphQuiz calls it. It's like the, I mean, I would say it's the label, but that's not really true. It's like the, the ID, the sub ID. So if you want to reference, um, um, so if you want, so, so first off, here's how we create the connections. We, we, we make a reference to uh, this node C1, and then we use this sort of path notation to drill into its components that you can reference. Uh, in this case, the, you can say east, that's what E stands for. So that's just saying we want the connection to this node to go out from its right part. Um, and we want it to connect to, and then N1, and then the first, you know, we drill into X, so that represents this input port, and then the West, because we want it to connect from, you know, on this side, on the West, on the West side of that element. Um, and so I think if you did something like this, and you um, re-ran, you can see it would try to connect to the right side, which is not what we want. Um, but anyway, so um, let's write a GraphWiz generator, which takes a module definition and kind of figures out how to um, figures out how to draw this or generate a dot file that we can then feed to GraphWiz and which we can then view in a web browser or whatever SVG viewer you have available. So um, that's going to be task number one for today. Um, so uh, what does that entail? Well, first off, it's very much like the visitor from the other day. Um, one difference being, uh, I think it was over here, one difference being that, um, and I, I, I mean, I might as well use it as a starting point. One difference being that um, um, we need to support cyclic graphs because, um, yeah, anyway, we need to support cycles, uh, not just, yeah, it's a graph, it will have cycles, basically, is what it boils down to. So that's not that's not much additional uh, complexity, but uh, I'll, I'll point out one thing that's different. Um, so um, this visitor here caches these return values. Um, when we're constructing a graph um, with this kind of visitor, what we're basically going to do is we're going to um, well, let me think. What's the best way to do it? Um, we're going to visit the whole graph, starting probably starting from the output nodes. Um, we can do it from either order. Actually, we can visit. We can fan out in either direction. Um, but it's easiest to do it, at least with the current way we're representing things, it's easiest to do it from the output nodes since the way the, you know, the way, you know, from the output node, we can figure out what kind of thing is connected to the output node and then we can fan out from there. Going in the other direction, 
um, is going to require more pre-processing just because of the way the graph structure is, right? It's the typical thing where the pointers point in one direction. And so if you want to invert that graph, you have to somehow first reverse it in one direction and then you can flip the, flip the directionality. But um, let's, let's imagine that we're visiting things um, by starting from the outputs and then computing what needs to be computed there. So um, um, let's see, so uh, graph whiz, I don't know. Let's call it dot generator. And um, uh, dot generator. Let's come remove this junk. Okay. Wrong text text editor. All right. Um, so I think what we're going to do is, um, let's see. Um, we get a module as a as an argument. And um, we probably, um, let's see here. We create this generator. And then we visit each of the outputs. Um, And let's see. Um, based on the kind of node, right? Based on the kind of node, we're going to do a different decision. But basically, we want to end up, let's see. Why don't I have that open? Let me open up that uh, dot file again. We want to generate this kind of entry for um, for every kind of node. So every node gets one of these lines, and then um, I honestly can't remember if you can do this before they've been defined. Okay, you can. So there's, but anyway, we might still want to do that in a second pass. But anyway, create uh, create one of these definitions for every type of node, um, and then you want to connect things up. And uh, I guess the big thing is the IDs here. You have to create a unique ID for every node, and then when I want to connect to a different node, uh, you want to get that ID back so you can reference it. And so I think that's what we're going to return, uh, like what this recursive thing is going to return is going to return the string ID that we're going to use as a reference in the um, in that graph. So that sounds reasonable to me. Um, so um, so let's see here. If you if we start with constant node. Um, actually, let's start with let's start with this. Um, uh, I think we need. I'm just going to call it lines. Um, I'm not going to concatenate it directly into a string for the usual reason, which is that. Um, because strings in Python are immutable, you the, Python does have a, a weird reference counting optimization, but it, it's not in PyPy only in C Python. But anyway, in general, when you're generating these li large like files incrementally, what you want to do generally is you want to create, say, a, for example, uh, a, a list of lines, and then you want to concatenate them uh, at the end, basically. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and so for a constant node. Um, Oh, and here's the other one. Uh, I'm going to have this next ID counter. Um, and so, um, um, 
So, so, so here's the trick with the cyclic stuff. Not strictly necessary for constant nodes, I guess, but for other things where as you're visiting one node, you recursively visit other things and you have to worry about it potentially cycling back to yourself before you've returned. And that's where normally in, with if you're doing things like purely acyclically, there wouldn't be an issue, but if there's cycles, you would hit this case. Um, if you're doing a cyclic visitor and you want things to be, you know, not be a problem in that respect, so here's what you have to do. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, make name. I guess I can use the node, but for now, let's just say um, let's just do this. I'll even look at the node for now, but let's just pass it in just in case we want to customize it in the future. So anyway, so that's uh, let, let's say this is how you um, you make a name. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is uh, upon entry, I'm going to uh, actually so so look at what this code does here. It's, it puts in this visiting marker um, while it's visiting the node, and then when it returns from the visitation, it fills in the, the real value. Um, in, um, in our case, what we're going to do is basically this. Uh, we're going to fill in, before we, re we recurse on anything else, we're always going to fill in this entry. So we essentially override this visiting entry so that if we cycle back, uh, we've already computed the part of the result that the recursion, the cyclic recursion might actually need, which in our case is just the name. So we can fill that in immediately um, before we recurse on any children. And now in this case, there are no other children. So it's not really necessary, but um, that's the idea. So um, let's see here. Um, all right, so we want to compute a line, and uh, it's going to be let's let's, it, let, let's use circles for that. Um, so it's going to be like there's a name, and then there's a shape, and there's a label. Um, I guess we can just use sort of raw string for that. No, so we'll still. Let's just do this. Um, so the label is the constant. And I guess that's it. And the things the things we have to fill in are um, the name and our value, something like that. Um, um, so so let's just fill this in. Uh, let's just fill this in first. And then uh, let, let me write the scaffolding around it, and then we'll do the other stuff. Um, and so uh, the what is it like? The uh, result is going to be digraph um, Something like this. Um, and the main thing here, I guess, is uh, we're going to uh, we're going to join the generated lines with new lines, and that's going to be the output. Um, but that's not quite it because we also have to, uh, for the output nodes themselves, 
Um, well, I guess that's actually okay. So the output nodes. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, for the output nodes, I think uh, I, I don't I don't know what the best. Maybe we'll use a box for that. Am I using the right notation there? Comma shape equals whatever label. Okay. Um, so shape equals box labels equals whatever. Um, And in this case, it's not node. This should be node value, not self value. And this should be name. So the node name. Um, so that's it for output nodes. So um, let's try that. Obviously, this is a very small subset, but um, suppose we have a test module here and um, we have a single output, and it's connected to 42. This is going to be coerced to a constant node, and from there it should do the thing. Um, and now if we say generate dot file, uh, test module, let's see what happens. Uh, unhandled default case. Yeah, that's really a string. Oh, right, right, right. Um, I guess like this, right? Uh, Right, then here, uh, I guess we'll do this. Okay. So, okay, yeah, th this didn't, this didn't do the trick. So, um, this shouldn't be necessary for this case, but I just want to show the general thing. Uh, in general, before you recurse, you should fill in your value, not by returning, um, but um, by filling in this thing. So if it cycles back to you, you've already specified your return value. Um, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I am going to recursively uh, if self operand or sorry if node dot operand then you recurse on that um, you get back uh, an operand name um, and by the way I guess what make name should do for us it should actually do this now that I think about it. We can do that right here. That would be very nice. Um, that way we don't have to do that uh, in every single little uh, function. Um, anyway, then when we recurse on this, we get back the operand name. Uh, and then you want to append a connection. Um, which I guess is going to be an arrow from the east part of that to the west part of us. So it's going to be from the operant name to us. Uh, 
and that actually did seem to work. So uh, we have a box that's labeled out. We have a constant, which is represented by a circle, labeled 42. And then we have a connection from that to um, there. Uh, let, let me just see if, to make sure there's nothing stupid here. But yeah, anyway. So, you know, that's already some form of progress, I suppose. Um, uh, of course, very basic. Um, let's uh, let's do just let's just do some of the others while we're at it. So, um, if we have a um, if we have a binary node. Um, I'm going to use this record thing we've used before. And um, um, let's see if I remember the syntax. You know, I actually feel like <laughs> um, these probably don't really deserve labels because it's sort of implicit for these operators uh, what is what. So I'm just going to use this notation I1, I2, or maybe I0, I1. Um, and then I think that's sufficient, right? Um, The thing we want to concat there is um, the name is before, and then the node op, which is the symbol for the for that operation, um, and then you know we do that sort of thing where we um, left name, right name. Um, I'm going to make some helper functions to, to to do this, like say connect to this from that or whatever. Um, um, Uh, so connect from um, in this case we want to connect to um, the first port let's just I guess we can just use um, I zero. And uh, um, let's see here. I think that's right. Okay, um, let's say, uh, let's say we have something like this. 
Oh really? There's no <laughs> there's no way to to add two constants. That's obviously uh garbage. Oh, I guess we don't have we don't have plus implemented yet. Um I'll do that in a sec, but uh let's just do this. Inconsistent types. Oh right, because of the with inference. Um let me make sure. Oops. Do something like this. Uh, not enough arguments for format string, so uh name of the thing. Oh. I'll just size this. Okay, this none thing is clearly all right, I still have to return to return the name. Um all right. I'm trying to remember how it would be nice to just be able to say connect this node to the upper part and the lower part so you don't anyway but I think this is actually okay for now um, uh, so let's just keep going so those binary nodes um, I, I mean, I guess there's a bunch of others. We'll, we'll just uh, go through them. Um, Um, kind of the same deal for concat node. So, for example, um, well, we can do we can do stuff here. Um, Uh, keep forgetting that.
Oh, that's not concat node, that's slice node. That looks reasonable. Um, concat node. Um, let's see. So here we have a bunch of operands. Um, Okay, I just realized for uh, this one we shouldn't need an output. Um, and then for a concat node, um, See. Label should be um, actually, I guess, should be um, something like this. And this should be. Uh, Join by pipe. Um, uh, actually, I guess this is real zero, real simple for I in range. Four I operand and N enumerate. Four I, four I operand and enumerate node operands. Uh, operand name is self of operand. And then you connect, you connect from operand name. Two name plus um, like that, something like that, I think. Um, Oh, sorry, that's not quite right. Um, have to surround that by okay, I should just. Should put the code into. All right, so port I one unrecognized, or port I zero. Oh, don't. Um, okay, 
let's just um, So, put these together, um, concatenate them, slice them, and that feeds into the output node. Um, maybe output nodes should be another shape, so boxes we're kind of using for operator type things. Um, so I guess we should make that something else. Um, let's see what we have available. I don't know if our arrow will look bad, probably. Um, no, I guess that's not too bad. So let's use those arrows for now. It looks a little bit aesthetically wonky, but um, at least it signifies that it's an output. Um, all right, so far so good. So we have this stuff. Let's do um, um, let's do sub -mod module instances. And those are going to be a little bit trickier because um, let's see. I guess that's not really true. Um, um, we're going to a module output node is something you can depend on. And so I think what you do for that is you descend into, well, um, let me think here. Um, let's do something like this. Because when you're referring to the, the pins of a module instance, the thing you want to reference, that thing doesn't really have a node in itself. That thing corresponds to a part of the record node corresponding to the whole module, um, the whole module instance. So um, let's have this function where you can specify um, I, guess, I guess it's not even technically a node necessarily. No, I guess it is actually. So this name is not just going to be a unique, um, like, so let me show you what I mean here. Uh, 
previously we had this assumption that each of these nodes in the graph corresponds to a node in the in the net list in the circuit but in some cases the 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 thing we want to refer to is more like these ports, like a port, an input port or an output port or something like that of another node, a bigger node that's like a composite, you know, a module instance or something like that. So um, this this is just providing a way to override the default name generation mechanism um, when you want to here. So um, for example, in this case, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to find whatever, you know, the name of the module there. Um, and, um, and then I'm going to make myself a name from taking the module name and concatenating, uh, let's see what it's called. Um, so you take the module name and then you concatenate the um i guess it's just node.name actually let me just see here right so it has a name which corresponds to the pin name and so yep i think that's what you want to do uh def module output whatever so i think that's actually as simple as that goes um And then for modules, um, you're okay with just getting whatever auto-generated name for that. Um, You can actually just return this directly. Um, so for the module, right, we get this name, we return it eventually. Then we have to um, we have to walk over its input ports. Um, No, that's not true. It's called connections. Connections is for that specific instance. So this represents the input connections. Um, the input connections. Let me see how this is going to work. Right, right, right. So as always, we do this, and then we have. Um, Let's see here. Um, something like that. And that's the name, and then it's the inputs, it's the module. It's just the module name. Um, and it's the outputs. Something like that. The inputs are the concatenation of um, these are dictionaries so if you just iterate over them like that that should actually do the trick no oh, actually that's not right so you have to do um, Same thing here. So 
that's kind of the shape of the module we're defining here. Um, then for each of these connections, let me just remind myself of how this thing works. So this is a dictionary that maps from, um, from nodes to other nodes. Um, um, input node. input node to to other node um, and for each of these um, you want to connect uh, you want to connect from so you recurse you recurse on that node which is whatever is downstream um, and you connect it to let's see you have to connect it to um, um, this colon uh, so it's the name of the module and then the input port which is going to be input node name something like that Um, let's make sure we can break existing code. Doesn't seem to. Um, oh, and, and actually, and let us do the ultimate input nodes as well. Those are those should be easy because I think um, an input node is just going to be. Um, Something like that. There's nothing downstream from it. Um, all right. So um, let's let's just go full hog. Let's try taking one of these guys and see what it does. This is obviously going to break, almost certainly, but it may not. All right. That looks not totally unreasonable. I guess this should be an R. Uh, our arrow to um, Yeah, that's reasonable. And you can see the carry chain here. So the lowest bit is here. So these, I don't know if there's a better way to guide the, the layout algorithm, but um, this is the lowest output bit. So it's the very lowest wire in the whole picture. And you can see the dependency chain is not too great. Uh, it's the XOR of zero, so that's obviously inefficient. Um, but X or of um, X or of the zeroth bit of in one and the zeroth bit of in two, it is correct. And then you can see there's kind of a a carry chain that propagates sort of diagonally from the bottom left to the upper right. 
and you can kind of see this this node up here has a ton of dependencies like a very long dependency chain because we're using this kind of ripple ripple carry adder <clears throat> so yeah um, so that's how you do that and if you compare with um, I guess what we were doing before with the, the ASCII printing, the pretty printing, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's a actually. L let me test that in a sec. You're right. If I if I rather if rather than using a um, that's actually a good test because right here we're not really testing the modules themselves. We're only testing the binary operators. Um, so, which is the biggest test case? So, let me actually do that. Um, so, let me let me do that. S say we actually, uh, rather than using a function for this, suppose we use a module. And we're gonna go, just going to call it adder one, and it's just um, it's just this. Um, So this is the same thing, just written as a module. Um, now that might be, at least the way we're doing it right now, that might be a little bit trickier um, to discover modules that way. Let me just think about it. No, I think that's fine because you discover modules through dependencies and so um, let me do something tricky, or not that tricky, let's be real. Um, but basically I'm going to, to take the same thing, oops, uh, and I'm just going to hook it up like this. And by the way, you can use positional arguments. Uh, actually, I don't think you can right now. So, um, and then I'm just going to uh, extract these. So the first argument is out and the other one is C out. Um, oh, and this is adder one. Yeah. Um, I have to think of what more, um, I have to think more generally about how we want to handle this, uh, but in terms of, like, there's always this thing, uh, like, the degree to which a bit vector of length one versus a bit is interchangeable, but for now, uh, let me just do it this way. Um... Cast a value. Um, so self is a bit vector type. Oh.
Oh, right, adder one. Um, um, because it's a subclass, so let's just handle that. Um, if instance uh, self module x Header one has no um, attribute. Um, Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, adder one. I mean, this layout is not like how anyone would lay it out by hand, but it's it's not garbage. I mean, you can kind of find your way around it. Um, All right, how are we doing in time? Maybe that's okay for now. Another reason this is a, uh, aside from being a useful, it'll visualize stuff. If we're going to generate, for example, Verilog code or some other target language, it's going to look much like this. Uh, I mean, much being a, maybe an exaggeration, but it's going to be the same kind of visitor pattern of handling different cases and mapping names, mapping pointers or identities from, from our world to some labels or IDs in their world and making sure things hook up and whatnot. So yeah, oops. That's pretty neato. Um, I guess let's also test with uh, adder 16, which is, is much more boring, but uh, let's just make sure it works because that's stuff we have right now. Yeah, so that's pretty reasonable. This is pretty clean. You can kind of see that divide and conquer structure very plainly. Anyways, I think that's it for today. Um, nothing, like I said, this is not, we're not, we haven't gotten to the real hardware stuff yet, but I mean, it, now the, it's sort of getting there, but um, this is mostly me, me, just me getting back into the swing of things and building up some, some basic tools. Um, but yeah, you can see how relatively easy it is to generate these kind of graph whiz dot files. Um, this kind of thing is definitely a little bit easier in a language like Python, or at least if you have dictionaries and easy ways to do string, you know, all this kind of stuff. But uh, it's not fundamentally a difficult task. And if anything, we had a little more 
a little bit more to do than usual because, you know, for example, if you want to use this for an AST visualizer, it's a tree. You don't have to worry about cycles. We had to worry a little bit about that. The way the modules work is a little bit of an extra hitch potentially, but um, I think we're good now. All right, I think I'll, I'll, I'll say that's it for today. Um, on Friday, I'll figure out what to do. There's a bunch of stuff we could do. I think just expanding the repertoire of operators and, and operations um, would be a good place to go. And um, and then hopefully for next week, the language will have, or at least I will know enough to, to know, to put together a decent language subset from that, which uh, I can use to introduce more formally. Like it'll, I, I guess it'll sort of be a whirlwind course of undergraduate logic design. Um, and I'll show you, I mean, how quickly, how much better it is to write. I mean, this is a pet peeve of mine, but there's a really heavy focus in um, in kind of logic design textbooks on either circuit diagrams or a fairly anemic, you know, sort of straight line notation for logic equations. But if you write things in this style here, you can express, especially structure that's not just like a few equations but like stuff like the adder being able to express divide and conquer patterns or these kinds of chaining patterns being able to do that in code rather than in diagrams is like a million times better so uh, we'll be able to cover all the fancy not even just the the basics but a lot of the fancier stuff as well like i can show you all the standard adder structures from textbooks even graduate level stuff and multiplier circuits and all these different circuits how compactly and elegantly you can write it out in this style so um, that should be next week, um, but for the for the final session this week on Friday, um, we will do more random stuff along these lines, uh, like a few other missing pieces that I want to get in before we start properly on hardware design. So uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, hopefully this was interesting. I'm pretty happy that we actually ended up getting the full graphics uh, generator finished. So anyway, until next time.